Live from the Business Radio X studio inside Renaissance Bank, the bank that specializes in understanding you. It's time for North Fulton Business Radio. And hello again, everyone. Welcome to another edition of North Fulton Business Radio. I'm John Ray, and we are broadcasting on a beautiful day from inside Renaissance Bank in beautiful Alpharetta. And uh, yes, folks, Renaissance Bank is, um, uh, they house us here in Alpharetta. And uh, here's what we found about working with Renaissance and the clients that we have, that we work with. Um, Renaissance big enough to handle their needs, pretty much any need they can throw at them, but they're small enough to do it in a personal way. And here's the other thing that's big in the news is safety and soundness. Renaissance is uh, has a rock solid balance sheet and you don't have to worry about what's going to happen. Are you seeing them in the headlines on Monday morning? So um, if that's the kind of bank you're looking for, go to renaissancebank.com and find one of their local offices. They've got some 200 around the Southeast ready to serve you and be in touch. I think you'll be glad you did. Renaissance Bank, understanding you, member FDIC. And now I want to welcome back to the show, Jeff Hawkins. Jeff was with us last year around this time, and he's back again. Uh, Jeff is with Carr, Riggs, and Ingram. Jeff, welcome. Thank you for having me, John. It's, uh, it's an honor to be on and glad to be back. Yeah, we're delighted to have you back. Uh, let's First of all, for, for those that uh, didn't get to hear you on your first visit here, talk about Carr, Riggs, Ingram, how you serving folks out there. Yeah, sure. So Carr, Riggs, and Ingram is a top 25 CPA firm in the nation. Uh, we're primarily located in the southeast, so also expand out to Texas, New Mexico area. Mm. Uh, but we're a full-service CPA firm. What my team specifically does is transaction advisory services. Mm-hmm. So that's for anybody that's in the M&A world, anybody that's looking to buy a company, sell a company, uh, even just kind of think about doing either or the other too, mm. right, before even we even get to the point of of actual engagement. So. Uh, again, we're, we're a consulting team, and so we work hand-in-hand with, again, buyers and sellers. We use that experience on one side or the other to help mm-hmm. the other side as well, You know, understanding what the market will accept, what they won't accept, and, again, just kind of being the shepherd through the process. The other kind of term we like to use, it's a little cheesy, but it's the solutions quarterback. Mm-hmm. So we like to be that person that will direct all that, the whole process. So. We understand there'll be other professionals that are involved, right? but we will be that person to introduce the right person at the right time. And again, try to shepherd that process to the finish line for, for the, the business owners. Yeah, that, you know, I, I hadn't thought about that as it relates to the, the work you do, but you really, you bring two parties closer together than they might otherwise end up being. That's right. And the quality of earnings, which is the the main product we produce, it really becomes a financial model that both sides use to get comfortable with the transaction. Sure. And all the way leading up to closing and working capital. And and again, that kind of gets kind of convoluted and complicated. But uh, again, that's it's just a tool to help you navigate that process. So you're not left with any questions at the finish line. So for those that don't know, let's let's explain briefly a quality of earnings report, what that's all about. Sure. So quality of earnings differs from like an audit or review in that it's really more forward thinking and forward looking. Mm -hmm. It still looks at past performance, but you pro forma what the buyer's going to, how they're going to frame the business into the financials. Mm -hmm. And then it also removes things that aren't recurring. So, you know, a really good example of what's occurred recently would be like PPP loans, right? So you may have gotten Mm -hmm. a million dollar loan. It may have gotten forgiven. It looks like income, buyer's not going to pay for that because it's not recurring or let's hope that it's not recurring. Right? <laughs> yeah, let's, let's hope, hope there's so. no more yeah. PPPs. Yeah, for sure. Or any reason to have a PPP, uh, employee retention credits. Another thing that you see mm. that could be income, it looks like income, but it's not really income. Right. Uh, so again, getting your recurring adjusted EBITDA is, is a big thing. And then again, the second big part about it is the working capital. You'd be surprised how many times people can agree on the EBITDA, but not on the working capital. Really? And it really can complicates things at the finish line because that is really the thing that happens as of day of closing and then day of opening of the new company. Mm. Whereas the EBITDA is something that can be a kind of agreed upon two, three months in the past. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I get that because um, 
it's easier to agree on historical data than it is cash in the bank. Without a doubt. <laughs> yeah. Without a doubt. Or, 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 or liquid assets, as the case may be. Right. Yeah. And a yeah. lot of deals will be cash-free, debt-free, Yeah, which means you're going to keep your cash when you sell, mm-hmm. pay off the debt you have, mm-hmm. but then the other assets are what's left in the business. Right. So things like customer deposits can become complicated mm-hmm. because it leaves a liability, but you took the cash. Right. But there's different ways you can try to negotiate those things or position it in the best way possible in your favor. Mm. And then again, that's what we're trying to do, helping with our clients understand again what a buyer where a buyer may be aggressive. Sometimes they're not aggressive at all. So you also have to be careful how you position it in the first place. You don't want to give away too much of your case, but you also want to prepare the seller that it could happen. Right. Somebody could come back and be aggressive in this arena or this arena. And that's, again, where we're trying to open people's eyes before it happens, before it's too late. This is where uh, I would think a a tremendous amount of your value is, uh, is in helping a client define and understand the term aggressive. I mean, for example, uh, among many terms that are intangibles, right? I mean, that's, it's whether someone's aggressive or not, that a business owner is not going to necessarily be able to determine. They may think they're aggressive just because they're considering a bid for their company. Whereas you've got experience with a lot of buyers, you see how they act, you know, how they've acted in previous transactions you've worked with them on and you, you know, exactly uh, much more cert- with much more certainty, whether they're really aggressive or, or how much this deal means to them, right? That's right. I mean, again, the quality of earnings is a report. It's a product. It's a report that you get. Yeah. But the most valuable thing is this advice. Yeah. And like you said, understanding the current market conditions, understanding where buyers land on mm-hmm. on certain things that you propose to them, it, it really is the the most important part. Right. Um, and again, the other thing is it's a psychology aspect of things as well, right? Of, of keeping the deal moving, answering questions timely, because if, if somebody goes into the weekend and there's a question that's really bothering them and they can't get satisfaction on it, mm-hmm. it may delay the deal or deter it altogether. Right. Right. And so being that kind of consultant to listen to them, again, kind of shepherd them through that process and, and really kind of make them feel more comfortable. You know, like you, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head when you said sometimes, you know, how do you advise on the aggressive side or not? Right. Right. Um, like you said, it, it really is based on kind of current experience in the market mm-hmm. and current trends. And then, and really, again, just kind of be, being somebody that works on the sell side and the buy side, that that's very valuable. Right. Because again, we can tell you on our last one, the buyer was thinking this, right? So let's prepare or position it in this regard, or let's go down this road with it. Yeah. And that's something you don't get off of. uh, Well, let's just put it like, let's put it like this. Um, You know, in this today's world, people uh, look at chat GPT and they think they can get all the answers in the world. Right. Well, guess what folks chat GPT can't help you with this. Right. I mean, you, this is uh, experience. This is uh, uh, the kind of, th- this is up to the minute understanding of people and, and what their motivations are. And you just can't get that from, from uh, um, you know, some AI program or whatever. No, you you hit the nail on the head. That's why I'm a big believer that the future of accounting is more consulting. Yeah. Because the the auditing, the tax, the more compliance-based stuff mm-hmm. will be the part that moves towards AI. Right. But the consulting, it, it's going to take people to yeah. to make to make two people come together at a $50 million transaction. It, it takes people to make that happen. Right. Right, for sure. Well, uh, speaking of uh, some other things that uh, are hard to uh, um, gauge without talking to someone w- with with uh, uh, that has the experience you do, um, let's talk about kind of what has happened here. You were here uh, May, uh, last May. Uh, we're doing the show twelve months later. So, what contrast where we are in the M and A market between where we were then and where we are now? Sure. It it really has been a 180. 
And I know that may sound a little bit extreme, but I, I can explain. So Jeff's bringing in the drama today. I'm bringing in the drama. <laughs> so I would say this time last year, uh, you could still pretty much go to market and sell a company with pretty strong confidence. It would not be that that difficult of a process. The mm. diligence would there would be diligence, but not as difficult. Mm-hmm. You know, I like to compare this to residential real estate. The same thing that just happened the last few years there. Sure. And and that everything kind of burst through after COVID. And for about two years, it was really hot and heavy. Mm -hmm. And, but that's because money was cheap, almost free, if you will. Right. And so people are willing to take a lot more risk. They're willing to buy something, maybe sight unseen again, kind of a real estate term. Right. Uh, That was happening with some certain transactions, especially smaller transactions. If there was three or four buyers after it, you may just have to buy it. Right. You can ask some questions. You'll maybe get some diligence. Uh, but the other thing is providers weren't even able to keep up with, with it. So there weren't great information to buy these companies off of. Mm. Well, kind of fast forward to a year forward today, while interest rates have risen, everybody knows that, something I think some people don't realize is that this is the fastest interest rates have ever risen, though. Right, and when that happens, buyers become sketchy, or they or they step skittish. Back. Yeah, they're yeah, skittish. They right. they step back from the table a right. little bit mm-hmm. because they want to see what it means for the environment. Right, and so really, that's kind of what's happened. Fast forward to today is buyers are more sensitive. There's more risk in the market. The money costs more, which is riskier itself. So you better be even more confident in the investments that you're making than where you were last year. The other thing is that earnings are now almost down across the board. There's certain industries, right, that are still doing well. Yeah. But earnings are decreasing for a lot of companies as well. So now you have buyers who are trying to then frame, well, what's the last, you know, 2020 was weird. 21 was weird. 22 was weird. Now 23, it's still being kind of weird in Mm -hmm. different ways. Yeah. And so how how do we get comfortable with our investment thesis? So uh, what I hear you saying is, is uh, basically recessionary related fears. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And like I said, it's really driven in, in that world, in the transaction world by interest rates, right? right. Because they may have mezzanine funds and funds that they raise debt with themselves, but a lot of times they're also using banks to help finance these. Mm -hmm. And, even though they may have enough money to buy something outright with equity, that's not the business model. And so you deploy some of it with one deal, some of it with another deal. And so you're trying to spread your equity and your debt Mm -hmm. risk out. And again, this just complicates things. So it's not that buyers don't want to proceed. It's not that they don't want to do deals. It's just, everybody's kind of hitting the, the pause button, if you will. Now, what this could mean, right, is the same thing that happened kind of during COVID in 2020 when nobody was transacting, is the floodgates could open again at some point. But I think, you know, with interest rates just got re- rose again this week. All right. So are we at that point yet? I don't know. It doesn't quite feel like we're at that point yet. And another thing that I'll, I'll comment on is, is the depth of the diligence now is another thing that's really kind of changed from what it was So I kind of touched on that a little bit, but, um, you know, what that really means is, you know, when we do a sell side quality of earnings and there's an investment banker involved and they have a SIM and we go to market and the buyers are involved, you know, we were getting maybe one or two phone calls worth of questions on our work and assisting the company going through diligence. You know, we just worked on one last week where it was our sixth phone call with them. Mm. Uh, I would say on average, there are now four or five phone calls. Well, those phone calls are hour and a half, two hours a piece. Mm -hmm. It's the CPA team. It's your whole management team. Mm. It's the whole buyer's team. And it's, it's intense, right? Yeah. And there's a lot of pressure. And, and so again, that, that's the other thing that's really changed here is people are digging deeper because when there's more risk, they're going to dig deeper. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. And what you're talking about, I heard somebody, a banker talking about this, actually this morning that, that, um, um, what you're seeing for companies is that a year ago, their financing costs, if they're variable have basically doubled over the last year. 
That's right. That's what you're talking about. And that's a big number. And so when you're talking about, um, and then what you mentioned is bringing the bank in when that, when that, um, uh, private equity fund brings their bank in, the bank's got their own considerations that are independent of the fund. That's right. Right. So talk about how that works and how that plays into how the fund views, how they're going to, uh, value a, a business. That's right. No, you're, you're exactly right. Each, each one's going to have their own kind of underwriting process mm-hmm. and, and risk rating process, but, but they're different. Mm-hmm. And so again, cause everybody comes from a different viewpoint, that private equity group is really familiar with that industry, that company, right? The bank, maybe not necessarily. So what we've seen is not only has private equity dug in a little deeper on their diligence, but now banks are requiring quality of earnings, and more and better quality of earnings, like mm-hmm. qu- more quality quality of earnings. Sure, a right. little play on words, uh, <laughs> but so that, that's the other thing that we've seen. So again, it, the whole ecosystem, as like I say, is tightened up. Yeah, and so what you could maybe get away with last year, if you had some maybe, you know, messy financials that you know you know your business, the operations of it are fine, but it doesn't necessarily translate into the QuickBooks uh, or the financial record keeping. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, those type deals probably got, didn't get penalized l- the last few years. Those type deals are getting penalized now. Mm. So you, if you've got, um, issues, I'll just say, I'll just put it that way. And you're the one to describe, to define that term issues, right? I mean, you, you're going to help a, a business owner define those issues, what, what issues are and what are big ones and what are small ones, That's right? right? And so if you've got issues though, what that really speaks to is having a quality of earnings report, right? I mean, in other words, this report is more important probably today than it was a year ago. That's exactly right. So the quality of earnings, again, it it is a product, it is a report, but through that process, we're going to identify the things that a buyer is going to look at and maybe ding you for, or Mm -hmm. Right. So the value, this is always important thing to keep in mind. The valuation is basically your adjusted EBITDA for the last 12 months times a multiple. So the accounting is the EBITDA part, right? Mm -hmm. The multiple is the risk part. And do you have a good enough systems or is your information reliable enough to gauge a purchase price off of, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Industry factors are all, all multiple driven things. So um, those are all important as well. So, but again, the quality of earnings, it gives you a number on the EBITDA side, but it helps you identify all the things that will help you improve the multiple as well. Because right, it's you got you to gotta do both variables. I mean, you can raise one and it helps, but if you raise both, that's the best mm-hmm. scenario. So a transaction advisory team like, like ours, mm-hmm. uh, an investment bank, uh, we, CRI Capital Advisors, we have an investment bank internally or you know other investment banks, even broker dealers, right? I mean, we would encourage if you're a business owner considering selling, get in touch with anybody in that ecosystem mm. and they can at least steer you in the right direction. Uh, Cause again, the, you know, a lot of times what we find from our business owners is they didn't think they were going to sell and then they opened the mail up and there was an offer because that <laughs> pr- private equity is sophisticated. They know, they know the companies in their space. They know the companies that they may want to acquire. Sure. And so they may just solicit you an offer. Mm-hmm. You didn't prepare at all. You hadn't tax planned. You hadn't wealth planned. All right. You hadn't looked at your financials. Haven't been audited or reviewed. Mm-hmm. Now what? All right. Right now, there's like a top ten CPA firm looking at your books. That's where you need somebody like our team to kind of help you. Again, first of all, just get your bearings right. Right. Like what just happened? How right. do we approach this? How do we attack it? Uh, so, like you said, the quality of earnings is definitely the product to get us in the door there. But it's it's the general consulting that goes around the whole thing. Yeah, of course. That, that's really valuable to them. Yeah, of course. Um, is, does it make sense for a business to have a quality of earnings report on a regular basis, just like they might have a uh, valuation? Yeah. So we actually get this question a lot uh, more recently because as quality of earnings have become more acceptable mm-hmm. and more used in a deal. Mm-hmm. Should I have an audit? Should I have a review? Should I have a compilation? Like what, what should I be doing? Mm -hmm. The way we look at it is if you're a year or two out trying to do an audit, 
well, first of all, it may be impossible to audit the first year because the accounting needs a cleanup. Mm. So going in under the quality of earnings umbrella as a consulting engagement gives you that ability to do that kind of work and that cleanup and, and help them again, kind of move along uh, in that process and getting the financials straightened out. Oh, this is good and, and important. I think, um, because most, I won't say most businesses, but I think a lot of businesses have some sort of accounting That's right. issue that the small, medium sized businesses, even if they're audited, right. They, they, they've, they've, they've got some sort of issue because the audit is more for internal purposes than external purposes. A lot of times, right? That's right. Or, yeah. or we'll do audits for people and there'll be 15 journal entries and they do not post them. Right, right. <laughs> and so it tells you how important the audit can be for right. actually running the business. Right, yeah. I, yeah, okay. So, uh, but this is interesting because I was thinking that the quality of earnings report was kind of at the end of the chain, as it were. If you, But what you're saying is it's really, it could be for some companies at the beginning where they really don't have to have everything all cleaned up in order to have that quality of earnings report. That's right. So, Again, if you're if you're in that situation where you've never had an audit review before, mm-hmm. this may be the best path for you mm. in the next year. You know, if you're looking to exit the next few years, right? You know, a lot of times the audit requirement comes from a bank or from debt. So if you don't have that, the QV may be better for you because it will again help to it will identify a lot of the same problems, right? But it gives us the ability to actually assist you as there's not the same independence requirements. And again, just be able to then share with you, right? Here's the aggressiveness of the buyers in your space recently. Yeah. So do we need to maybe spend time on everything or do we need to risk assess it and spend time on the 10% that really matters that they're really going to focus on? Yeah. And that, that, what that makes sense for the scenario you talked about where somebody gets an offer in the mail that they want to seriously consider, uh, they need to get you on the phone immediately. That, that's right. Now, we, I actually had a call this morning on the way over here for a guy that's selling his company. Uh, he's an agency and he wasn't expecting it, got the offer, doesn't understand the working capital side of it at all. Mm-hmm. So they've reached out to us to engage us on that part of it. But we've already identified two different parts of the deal that we think the seller may be a little aggr- or the buyer may be a little aggressive on. Mm. Um, and again, maybe it's fair, but but, but pointing out those things to at least let's talk about them, right? Like let's get to, to a middle point versus just being through the lawyers, because sometimes that happens a lot. Like I'll see the communication is just a red line to a red line mm. report, right? Just changes through red line. <laughs> attorney wars, right? That's attorney yeah. wars. Yeah. I mean, it's good for them, right? I right. Mean, yeah, exactly. But it doesn't help the deal get to the finish line. So right. again, trying to help them. And the other thing that, again, with the parlays to the working capital that's so significant is what if your closing balance sheet? So again, you were agreeing working capital two months ago. But your closing balance sheet is now significantly different because the the business changed or the economy changed, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, if you were supposed to deliver a million dollars at closing, now you only have eight hundred thousand. Mm-hmm. Well, if nobody says anything, you're going to be paying two hundred thousand at closing, All right? Because you you delivered a shortfall of working capital. Well, what we found on the last three transactions that we were getting their closing estimated closing balance sheet for the seller before. And looking at it and saying, hey, this is not, you're going to fall short. Yeah. Reach out to this buyer. I go, okay, we'll change it. Because it, there's already been half a million dollars of diligence fees spent, four or five months in the process. Everybody's good. Well, now if the seller comes back and says, well, this isn't, you know, I wasn't expecting this $250,000, it, it can delay the deal. Mm-hmm. Now maybe the financing changes yeah, because the interest rate just changed. Right, right. right. So all those things can complicate a deal. That's why you need to get them done really as quickly as you can once it gets to that point. But so helping the seller see that before it's too late, it's, an, it's really invaluable. Well, you and I were talking about this before we came on the air, just the, the importance of psychology here. And, um, and this is where you come in, right? I mean, you, you, the business owner is passionate about their baby and we're all passionate about our babies. Right. Um, um, and sometimes you can get, get the economics of the situation mixed up, right? Like to you, use your point is if, if, 
if you've already spent half a million dollars of diligence fees and the question is over $250,000, why are we worried about the details of that, right? That's right. Yeah. So, and, and that's where you need somebody sitting beside you that's dispassionate that, that can talk you off that ledge, right? Yeah, that's right. Cause you know, surprises when it, when it comes to this, mm-hmm. especially, you know, especially like we agree on the purchase price. We agree on the EBITDA. We're three months down the road and now here comes this big question I wasn't expecting. Yeah. I mean, that's about as stressful as it gets. Yeah. Right. Right. Because this process has already been the most stressful year of your life leading up to the, to it. Right. The last thing you want is a big surprise at the end. Yeah. So this is, that's really what all this work is trying to do is to prevent those big surprises. Yeah. And, and it works the other way too. I mean, that business owner has got sand in their brain, Mm -hmm. right? And from the beach, they're already laying on metaphorically. Right. And, uh, um, that, that buyer comes back with something that's, that's, they're trying to take advantage of that, but you know, maybe, you know, better, right. That's and, right. And, and, and can help that, um, seller that might give in to something they shouldn't give in on. So it works the other way too. That's right. I mean, if a buyer knows you're not being represented, mm-hmm. they're going to be more aggressive because yeah. we see it a lot. And that's sometimes we get engaged after some, after the buyer has done a quality of earnings and it was a big shock. Mm-hmm then sometimes we'll get engaged to then go do it from management side. Mm. And then usually the answer is somewhere in the middle. Right? right. Right. But that's then the conversation that starts. Yep. But that's why you need the accountants involved to help you with that. And again, to say, Hey, this is fair. This is not fair. And that's what happens a lot, right? They'll come back with five adjustments. And we're like these three. Okay. You're, it's hard to fight these. Yeah. These two, we don't agree here's our stance. Here's our, here's the reason why we're going to argue it. Mm -hmm. And then you just kind of push it that way. Right. Right. And, and and usually again, not to say you're always going to get what you ask for, but if you're reasonable about these things and very, and communicate early and often, it helps tremendously. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Folks, Jeff Hawkins is with us and Jeff is uh, with the transaction advisory uh, services. Um, folks he's, he runs that uh, uh part of car rigs and ingram uh so jeff i would love it if, as we kind of coming down here to the close uh if you could share a success story i'm sure you've got many that you could share but a success story that helps illustrate the great work you do sure so uh this deal is actually going to close probably next week mm. so it's a it's a very recent example uh, it was a sell side engagement. So again, we were hired by the seller. Uh, they were represented by an investment bank as well. So we worked together with that team. Basically, the business is highly concentrated with one customer, a very big customer. It's about 90% of their business. And all of their selling uh, rates were, uh, or their contract rates were set, right? So I'm going to sell you XYZ product for a certain price for three years. Well, that contract was signed in 2020 before COVID. Mm. Well, so guess what happened in 21 and 22? Mm. The wor- some of the worst inflation ever. Sure. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, if you're on a fixed free, uh, fixed fee price contract, but your cost goes through the roof, guess what happens to your business and your margins? Yeah. Squeezed. Completely squeezed. Mm-hmm. So they were now trying to go to market because I mean, it was time like the, the owners were ready to, to trend, uh, to retire basically. Right. And so they're not willing to wait. And so what we had seen on prior deals that, that buyers had accepted were pro forma pricing adjustments. And so this is again, something you would never catch in an audit Mm -hmm. or you can't, you're not allowed to sure. You never do this in audit or review. Right. But what we did was, is they were in the process of negotiating the new contract with the new rates. So we were able to take product sales in the past and apply the new rates to them because the, the argument is that the buyer as buyer, you're going to get the full benefit of this new contract seller got none of it. Right. So to sell the business off of that old contract, Mm -hmm. it's not fair. Right. And so we were able to get that pro forma adjustment accepted they didn't accept a hundred percent of it. I think they came in at about 85. They came, you know, because again, that's, that's still a, that's a great, great number. A great yeah. win. Right. And, and again, cause, 
uh, Ernst and Young was on the other side. They came back with a different calculation. Again, they just kind of met in the middle and said, okay, that's what we agreed upon. Ended up being $25 million on the purchase price. Wow. So it took it from 50 to to 75. You paid for yourself many times over on that. I would, I would think so. <laughs> the, the ROI was a great one. Uh, that, wow. That's what a great story. That's right. So, but just knowing that buyers are willing to accept something like that, mm-hmm. what well, we always tell people, if you don't ask, you don't get right. Right. And so right. but it doesn't mean you can ask for ludicrous things or things that are unsupportable. But again, when you have contract rates and you had sales by product, mm-hmm. you can marry those two things together. And your cost structure didn't change, right? Because you you don't have to hire more or less employees. You're just selling at a higher price now. Well, and again, I love your point about how this doesn't show up in the audit or the review or whatever, because it cannot. It cannot. It, has, yeah. it just has to be what yeah. happened. And so what, you, what you've what you done is you've taken a um, an income state, statement item and you've turned it into an asset that you can describe with uh, a lot of clarity. That's right. uh, in terms of what this is an asset the company has going forward that you, the, the, the buyer will benefit from. And you, you obviously made the case for that and it worked out great. Yeah, it, it was great. And, um, I think they owe us a steak dinner is all I have to say. I think they owe you a few, but <laughs> maybe in, maybe at a nice, uh, 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 warm place Island somewhere. Uh, yeah, I love that. Uh, Jeff Hawkins, folks, with Car Riggs Ingram. Jeff, this has been great. Congratulations on your great work, and uh, we're just delighted you could come in and share that with us and uh, keep it up. Um, let's get to the most important question, though, which is how folks can get in touch with you. Sure. Well, John, again, thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I'd say the best way is, you know, I, you know, as a consultant, I give out my cell phone number. So uh, I can give out my cell phone number, 404-444-6902. You can always remember my number because it has so many fours in it. <laughs> uh, you can also find me on LinkedIn. I stay pretty active. People in the M&A space are pretty active on LinkedIn. Uh-huh. You see recent transactions, things like that. So we try to stay active there. And then uh, also give my email, uh, jhawkins at com. Terrific. Uh, Jeff Hawkins, folks, with Car Riggs Ingram, uh, a partner there. Jeff, thank you so much for coming in. Thanks, John. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Hey, folks, just a quick uh, thought for you. Uh, speaking of uh, dysfunctions in your business, um, the folks at Office Angels are fantastic at ironing out the dysfunctions that you may have in your business as it relates to administrative tasks, bookkeeping, or other issues that you're spending too much of your time on as a business owner, but you really need someone else to take that off your plate. Um, They've got a whole team of angels that fly in, get the job done, and then fly out, and they do it on an ongoing or as-needed basis. I would suggest you get in touch with the chief executive angel there, SES Cabido, at 770-442-9246, or go to officeangels.us um, if you're shy. But uh, trust me, SE is terrific. I use her for my business, and shes I couldn't uh, work uh, without Office Angels. So uh, check them out. I think you'll be glad you did. And a, a, a couple of quick notes as we close. Um, I've got a new book coming out this year. It's called The Price and Value Journey, Raising Your Confidence, Your Value, and Your Prices Using the Generosity Mindset Method. If you want to know more about that or the podcast of the same name that I have, you can go to pricevaluejourney.com to learn more there. And a big thank you to our listeners. We're uh, This month, the uh, May 2023, we're celebrating seven years as uh, open as uh, the North Fulton Studio of Business Radio X and of this show, North Fulton Business Radio. We're up to like about 660 episodes of this uh, show series, and we've only made it this far because of you, our listener. You uh, continue to support us, uh, show us love on social media, share the show when you uh, hear somebody that a business leader like Jeff who uh, does great work and you know of somebody that needs to know about their services, you share the show. So thank you for all that activity and support. Uh, That's how you help us uh, be the voice of business here in the North Fulton region. So thank you. So for my guest, Jeff Hawkins, I'm John Ray. Join us next time here on North Fulton Business Radio.